Are you in the beginning stages of a new business and trying to understand how to project when you'll reach profitability or how long of a runway you have with your current cash balance? Well, the best way to manage your cash flow is by mastering cash flow forecasting. It really is the most important business tool for your startup. And our guest this week on Wise Up Wednesday will help you understand the cash flow forecasting and more. Ah, hello, everyone, and welcome to Wise Up Wednesday on the Startup Life Show. I'm your host, Andy Lyons, startup coach to first time founders. And after raising four businesses of my own, I now help newly minted business owners sleep through the night by giving them peace of mind. That's right, using my Andy Licious strategies, solutions, insights, and inspiration, these founders are building profitable and sustainable businesses without spending a fortune or wasting valuable time. And I'm delighted that you carved out time to tune in and up your founder game. We are streaming live right now on LinkedIn, Facebook, Periscope, YouTube, and Twitch, thanks to the oh so delicious StreamYard platform. And those of you tuning in live, please use this opportunity to expand your network. I mean, I don't know about you, but we don't have any networking events around here in Boston. So online events like this is a great way to connect with folks, share your URLs for LinkedIn, and you know, follow each other in social media. You never know where your next collaboration will come from. Your questions and comments are important, so please pop them into the comment threads during our conversation and we'll do our best to answer them live. And hey, if you know someone who might benefit from our conversation today about cash flow forecasting, tag them, have them come join us. We'd love to see them. I am so excited to share today's guest with you. Let me just pull up a little something, something here for you. So while I read his background. Never one for suits and ties or long days in windowless offices, Brad Eben Ho abandoned the world of corporate accounting to found Accountfully, a modern outsourced accounting firm that serves modern brands and businesses. And by challenging the traditional accounting firm model, embracing technology and emphasizing the importance of a work-life balance for himself and his entire team, Brad has proven that with a little imagination and a lot of hard work, accounting can be as cool as the clients he partners with. I just love that something fierce. So let's bring Brad in and find out more about him and accountfully, shall we? Let's give him a hearty applause and a wonderful welcome. Hey Andy, thanks hey. for the great welcome. I am so happy to have you here. You know, I always like to get a little bit of a background from someone who has launched their own business before we get going into the meat of our conversation on Wise Up Wednesday. So please share with folks how it is that you went from being on payroll and a nice firm working away as an accountant and launched your business. Yeah, um, really excited to chat here today, um, Andy. So <clears throat> very kind of interesting story. I think everybody who's a founder um, of a business always has somehow of an interesting story um, of, of how they've gotten where they have. So um, anyways, my entire life, I was basically, you know, four point student, salutatorian, very good athlete, just everything by the book and, and great, go to college, do good, get a job at, uh, I started with a big four accounting firm, Price Warehouse Coopers, and I'm from Michigan. So I was working in Detroit, transferred to the Chicago office. Um, and there, uh, basically I was essentially in the corporate world traveling. And I remember one day and I was kind of at that, you know, 25, 26, 27 year old mark where you think you're smarter than everybody else or you're starting to get to that point maybe. Um, and I was starting to kind of, you know, realize some things, or identify some things, just, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, uh, economically, politically, things like that. You know, you start waking up a little bit as you're on your own for a couple of years and then move into a big city. And I remember like one day just looking at and thinking about, um, you know, my one of the partners at the uh, CPA firm or the accounting firm I was at, and I was like, he seems very successful, but I feel like I'm smarter than him for some reason, right? So like I can do this myself. And it was like an epiphany that mm -hmm. came up that was like, all right, well, let's do it. And, and now is a better time than ever to do it. So long story short, um, moved from Chicago down south to Charlotte. And now I live, we live in Charleston, South Carolina. I started accountfully with my now wife, um, Meredith, who's my business partner at the time, girlfriend, but we moved down here. And essentially we identified that there was a 
hole in the market for, it was right when cloud-based systems were coming to market, software as a service applications, right. books online, bill.com, and we could help and, and, and support clients in a more uh, virtual um, um, <clears throat> online forum. And we realized that small businesses really needed a lot of, not just bookkeeper help, but they also needed bookkeeping plus advisory mixed together at a very affordable price. So essentially that was the kind of like epiphany moment and that's kind of where we did it and identified a hole in the market and we've been executing ever since. Now we're um, about 34 people in Charleston uh, with an office in Nashville, clients nationally. And it's oh great. Because today we were, uh, we made the Inc. 5000 list for the second straight year today was, uh, um, went out to the world. So very exciting time at Accountplay. Congratulations. That's Thank amazing because you. you've been at this, what, nine years maybe since you launched? Yeah, I think we launched in early 2012. And like mm -hmm. the first year, year and a half is just like, wait, what are we doing? How do we do it? You know, then basically after that, kind of the, the you know, 18 month mark, I think that's when we kind of realized where the business model was and really been executing on that, and iterating it and, you know, packing it in and enhancing it along the way. So uh, eight, nine, 10 years. So it's crazy. I remember um, one time I was uh, reading a book about like QuickBooks consulting or something like yeah. that. I realized soon, I was like, I want to uh, create a business, but I'm really good at accounting, but I'm not the traditional accountant. Like, so I realized that, uh, why don't I go ahead and try to partner with creatives and other cool people who are like launching great brands, you know, progressive food and drink companies, et cetera, and, and maybe collaborate in that manner. So that's what we did. But I remember one time I was looking at a, reading a book and it was like, at that point it was the, the firm or it, our name wasn't accountfully. Mm -hmm. and it was like, oh, Brad, everything was Brad and Meredith's company, Brad and Meredith's company, Brad and Meredith's company. And I was like, how do we get outside of that? I want it to be a brand. I want it to be a name. I want it to be bigger than me and bigger than Meredith. And, and it's kind of crazy, like seven, eight years later, like where we're at now. So it just kind of goes and it, it kind of organically grows by itself. And you just right. have to make good well, decisions and move forward. Well, what I find especially exciting is that you've, you're doing this with your beloved. And, yep. you know, any thoughts on that? I mean, I had a business with my husband for several years. It was a dot com and heavily VC backed. And uh, I can say it was a little challenging. But, you know, when you have good tools and and communication put into place, how has it been for you and Meredith? Um, it's been uh, an interesting journey. I think initially it was hard because we both wanted to do everything together. And then you realize you need to kind of compartmentalize and say, OK, Brad, what are you doing? Meredith, what are you doing? You know, are you marketing, sales, operations, HR? And, and these are your clients, these are our clients. Let us go and execute and, and give each other breathing room. And, and, and that's really kind of what helped along the way to kind of move forward in that manner. So essentially now that um, I think that was the toughest challenge, but now as we've kind of grown, there's been more and more leadership team members, manager team members to kind of rely upon. So there's a lot of days we don't ever talk, don't ever see each other. And then like, you know, we're at home chatting and it's like, oh yeah, well this happened today. So as you get bigger, it gets a little bit easier from a day to day, but there's a lot more stress involved. Clearly because there's a lot of decisions that need to be made along the way, yeah. but communication and just compartmentalize and make sure and allow everybody to do their thing without kind of overseeing and controlling them. I'm so glad you shared that because there are a lot of co-founders out there that are beloveds, you know, they're partners in life and love and you know, they need to understand that they can navigate and that there are examples out there of, you know, people who are doing this. And it's so important, of course, with that communication and yeah. being able to talk and um, and also understand your roles and be able to define what it is that you do best. So I love that. But, you know, you I love it, too, that you launched your business and you were focusing on what the cool kids were doing and the innovators and people are on the edge so that you could participate without having to do it yourself yeah. and um, learn from them and be exposed while serving their bottom line. Um, is that why you chose that as a customer segment? Because as an accounting firm, you have a lot of choices on who you want to serve. Yeah. Well, we initially, when we started, when we launched our business, we were like, <clears throat> with all the, and we were just chatting before this, Andy, about the four hour work week, right? And like, I read that like during our kind of first year and a half when we're trying to figure out what to do. And we were consulting the first year and a half, right? Well, the problem with consulting is it's project-based, you have to keep selling what's going on next month. And then during, um, when I was reading that book, it was like light bulbs to me, like, you know what? Every business needs bookkeeping. Literally every business, whether you're the 
owner itself is doing it, whether you have a bookkeeper doing it, whether you have a hired employee, you have to keep your books, you have to process payroll, you have to pay bills, you have things like that, ready for taxes. So I was like, oh, light bulb, we need to become bookkeepers. So how do you become bookkeepers, right? And, and get that recurring revenue. So like it was kind of like, you know, I learned that or we learned that. Um, so when we did that, we started doing that. We're like, let's go ahead and target non-inventory based companies, right? Because I was, I was for a short term, I was a controller for a, um, for a wine based company and, and it, it was inventory and a lot of things going on with inventory. It's, it's a pain to, you know, account for. So we're like, let's just target like tech platforms and then creative professional services like digital agencies, video production companies, marketing services, things like that. Let's just target them because they're sometimes the coolest, the creative people in the room, you know, they wear colorful shirts, socks, <laughs> you know, you know, a bit, you know, ride bikes to work. Like this is, you know, seven, eight years ago, right? Like it's completely different, you know, it's kind of more mainstream right. now. But we targeted those type of people and, and to start targeting growing their business that way. And then we ended up um, somehow getting involved in, I mean, there's a, a long story with it, but getting involved with a lot of natural food and drink companies, which is kind of our biggest platform or niche now where a lot of the new foods or the progressive foods you see in like Whole Foods, a lot of those mm -hmm. brands are our clients. Like, fake meat, right? Like almond milk, uh, organic, uh, you know, or I guess. Uh, hey, food uh, company you know, founders out there. there. What's that? I say hey to the food company founders out there because right. I know so quite like, a few. Ice cream, things like that. So it's yeah. like now we've become, we want, didn't want to do inventory. Now we do inventory, but we still have a huge base of progressive kind of uh, marketing companies and tech companies and things like yeah. that. So now it's just kind of built on it. But, you know, that's kind of where it was like, how do we become, you know, part of conversations or look at the most kind of creative or interesting person in the world. And that can make our accounting job fun. So yes. <laughs> and we all know accounting is very creative folks, just because it looks very black and white on the surface. <laughs> it can yeah. be creative and fun, especially yep. if you love numbers like I do love numbers. Um, and so, cause you know, with the startup world too, is that you're going to be working with people who don't necessarily have the funds, but as I say to all of my clients, find the funds because this is not where you want to be spending your time. Get someone to set up your QuickBooks for you. Get folks working on these numbers for you because you cannot manage your business without the numbers, whether it's marketing data or cash flow data. You need the numbers because otherwise it's like driving a car without a steering wheel. You are going to crash. Yep. So, you know, and anyone who ever listens to me online and everywhere I glow, I'm always talking about cash flow projections. To me, there it's really it's one of the most fun tools <laughs> for accounting. It's not just generated basically uh, off your QuickBooks like an income statement or a balance sheet. But what I love about it the most is that it will it constantly informs you. So whether it's, you know, how much, you know, we just raised a million dollars, how long is this going to last us? And are we going to do what we said we're going to do with that money? Or just understanding how the money comes in and then flows right back out and tracking things as important as taxes, everybody. Just always put money aside for taxes. This is what, you know, the cash flow balance, the cash flow statement can help you do. So what I'd like to first do is pop up what a cash flow projection looks like, everybody. I'm going to do a quick screen share because I want you to get the name of it. Okay, let me just answer a quick question from Marielle. Marielle, um, there's this great book out there called The 4-Hour Work Week, written by, I just said his name earlier. Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss. And really what he was talking about, Marielle, was if you have a lot of systems and things set up so that recurring revenue on its own, a lot of affiliate marketing, things like that. You can tune into your business for four hours a week, make sure everything's running smoothly and go back to what you're doing. But Brad and I were talking before the show about, yeah, that's a fantasy for most businesses. You have to have hands on. And I think Tim has come to that realization as well. Right, Brad? Yeah, definitely. And I think for me, the theme was understanding like recurring revenue is, is where it's at. It's easier to grow your business when you know how much money is guaranteed to come in each month, as well as then identifying systems that can share data between each other. So instead of manually entering data here and here and here, it's you enter it here and then it flows everywhere through it. So like that's kind of how we process and, and systematize our, our, our clients workflow from a front end operations, plus our internal workflow behind the scenes. So, you know, again, I think the themes, a couple of themes I was able to kind of create from there. 
That's awesome. Um, I'm just going to do a quick share screen because, you know, that would have been nice if I'd done that ahead of time. Hang in there, everybody. Uh, make sure I grab the right one. Here it is. So I really just want to give everybody an understanding of what a cash flow projection looks like. Okay. And just so you know that you've seen it now, because I know many of you watching this are like cash flow, what projection, huh? You know, you know, your income statement, you probably know your P and L um, and, and some of the other, some of you in the food industry will understand your cost of goods sold. But this is a document that's very, very helpful for folks. And I'm just going to sort of scroll it down here because you can put in your different types of cash sales, what's coming in, and you can break this down into all different uh, item numbers of what you're bringing in. But now you know what's coming in that month and then what's going out. Really understanding and digging deep into what's it costing you to market? What's it costing you in any kind of interest or office expense or purchases? And you get to fill this puppy out and you can have it ripple through the whole year so you know what you're spending during the year. And now you know what you're spending out and you can see when things are minus. So you know, and down here, what's important is when can you pay yourself? Because no one's going to do your business for, <laughs> for free. Neither should you. How soon are you going to be able to pay yourself? If you have any repayments that you need to do more than anything, this helps uh, when you're raising money, your investors will feel so much more confident that you know what's in this document. So that's just me as uh, the overview of cash flow forecasting. Brad, please chat with folks a little about why you know that this is such an important tool for founders to use. Definitely, definitely. So, um, you know, cash is king at the end of the day, right? What, <clears throat> from a kind of reporting and internal decision making standpoint on a month over month basis and looking kind of backwards, we, we kind of want to focus on accrual based reporting, which matches revenues and expenses. But before I get into that, or we discuss that on the road, I want to like, I think from what Andy shared, the biggest thing is if you have money in the bank, understanding where it's going to go, when it's going to go out, what's going to come in and, and projecting it out. That was a very simple spreadsheet that then allows you to put every line in it that, that can do that, right? This is good for startups or somebody that's just doing it themselves to map it out on a spreadsheet because you don't need anybody else to do it, right? And then you can kind of adhere to it, you know, going forward and, and look at it going backwards on a month over month basis. A couple of things are number one, you need to understand where you're at, correct? So by that, I mean, if you don't know what you're spending each month looking backwards and you're not focusing on that, then how do you know what you're going to be spending each month going forward? So it also is key to ensure that you have your books updated or something going on where you're managing and understanding that. But also then going forward, um, how are you going to um, you know, manage this and make sure you have all the inflows and outflows as well as ensuring that you have any money saved for taxes along the way as well. So it just makes your life easier. I think it like makes you sleep better at night because you kind of have an idea where you're going. And a lot of the stuff is, uh, you know, a lot of people don't like talking about finances and cash because they're like, I wasn't good at accounting and things like that. But it's one of those things that once you get over mentally from the block of not wanting to do it, you feel kind of that anxiety goes down. You're like, okay, I have a hundred grand in my bank account. If I do this, this, and this, where is this going to go? How long can I last? And what do I need to do to get from a, you know, a sale, a revenue aspect of five grand a month or 15 grand a month or whatever your goals are. That's right. And you can track different items of your products or services to see how well they're doing. And of course right. you have your marketing strategy and that's a different tracking sheet, but you're going to, you need to know how much money that you're going to invest in your business to leverage these sales items. But one of the reasons I also like it is, well, what if I'm able to sell this much and then get this money in and you know, do all, it's the what if in the experiments. I'd also like to throw out there, I hear this a lot, Brad, and I just know it isn't true. I hear it from women. I'm just not good with numbers. That's no, that is not true. I know that you walk into a store and they say they're having a 25% off sale. You know exactly what that outfit's going to cost you. You're yeah. good with numbers. You're at the store. You see, you know, the, there's a sale there. You know, numbers are your friend, right, Brad? Yep. Definitely, definitely. Again, like this isn't, uh, you know, calculus. This is basically putting a couple numbers in a spreadsheet and having these formulas already created. So if you're not good at adding or subtracting, 
leveraging these tools to help you out, right? And again, hundred dollars, twenty five dollar percent off. That's seventy five dollars. Like there's things like that that kind of you know comes as second nature. And the other thing I'll say about doing like a cash flow forecast, understanding your cash flow, doing your books. Like you know, some people come to us and they're like, well, hey, I do it this way and it works for me because I see the numbers this way. And, and they're at a good position for that. And, and, and maybe that's good for you, right? So what, I'm, what I like, what I, I recommend to people that are kind of, especially starting out and don't have a huge budget for support or advice, but figure out a system that works for you and leverage it. And, and if you're not good at numbers, but you look, you're more visual, is there something that you can do that can help you more visually versus just in a spreadsheet? There's a ton of tools that exist out there for that, right? And then leverage that. And then when you're doing it, make sure you're not, you know, make sure you're leveraging it and, and referencing it on a very periodic break basis, right? So, you know, one of those things, it's like in college, I got to do a paper, I do a project, you brought the last minute and it takes forever. But what if you just every Friday for an hour or 10 minutes or 20 minutes update this spreadsheet of where you're at for the month or your books for the month, right? And periodically review, because when you do that, you get basically, you know, however long it takes to become a habit and actually like form every week right. you get in place and then you're able to run your business much better and much more efficiently. And again, it takes about one thing off your brain because you know where you're at kind of as, as a second nature versus just running blind. Right. And, you know, you've heard this before, founders, there's working on your business and there's working in your business. And when you're working on your business, it's when you're taking time to step out and see your business out from this observer's point of view. And that's why the numbers are so helpful to look out and say, OK, this is giving me this information. What do I need to do? Or mm -hmm. you can drive your numbers by taking certain action steps to get your numbers to a different place. So if you know that you're spending way too much money on an overhead item, you can say, OK, that's got to come on hold until we have more cash in the business. And you know, to get back to the, the numbers are our friends, founders, I'm giving you permission, step into this. You are a smart, intelligent person. You are a problem solver. That's why you're a founder. Do the numbers, put them into your life. Hire accountfully if you don't want to deal with them pesky figures getting getting into the spreadsheets. Let them do that for you so that you can then have the information in front of you and make the best decisions for your business and then get back to working in your business. <laughs> and Marielle has a question. Any tool or website to access these tools that Brad would suggest? You mean for uh, more visual or? What's that? I'm, be, I'm asking, uh, Marielle, you mean for more visual or? Because there, you know, there's the accounting platforms that you can get, um, whether online if you're doing your QuickBooks online. What other suggestions do you have, Brad? I mean, I think you know, uh, I guess a couple of things. So online, like you know, bookkeeping uh, systems like QuickBooks Zero, Wave Accounting, things like that are kind of very inexpensive, especially the lower versions that get you set up. Leveraging those tools by in, in their functionality, like your bank account and credit card, right, is is kind of a start. But a lot of these spreadsheets, if you if you look at like if you follow people like Andy or other influencers that are like business coaches, every one of them has like, hey, here's a template spreadsheet to start with. You know, you can go into Excel and search templates, go to Google Sheets. That's search. where I got the one I showed you guys. Just a quick Correct. and dirty. Right. You know, they're all in they're available. And again, then you can see one that like makes more sense to you or not, as well as like a lot of the, you know, uh, you know we're in Charleston, there's a, a SBC or small business. Um, development, uh, you know, mm -hmm. non a lot of them are free coaching for small businesses. You can go and access it. They have these tools. They have retired people that are there consulting for free. You go talk to them. They're like, hey, try this out. There's again, it's never been easy to, it's never been easier to find templates and information from your desktop, you know, your computer, Google, etc. Um, and they're all out there. It's, you know, and, and leveraging people like Andy or a counselor or whoever to say, hey, I, I'm looking for this something. What do you recommend? And, 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 you know, they'll be able to provide for you. Right. And it's such a great question, Marielle, because what happens in the Excel spreadsheets is that they'll, it'll create a chart. So someone who might be visual will get that chart, either stacked column chart or they'll get a pie, you know, with colors. <laughs> Once the numbers are in, you can present them in, in many different ways. And as I'm always saying, there's a video for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. YouTube is unbelievable with everything to happen. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of uh, things out there for you. you know? And uh, once again, I was a, you know, brand new company or my own and um, self like at some point and you're like, I, I need some help. And sometimes you're like, trying to leverage everybody and pull as much information as possible. And sometimes it's like, let me just sit down for a minute, look at myself, 
try to create something that I can function and, and work with. I, everybody, you know, we all have templates, but then every time it kind of you custom to what you're good at. And then you're like, look, I can do this and do this. And then I can do this myself for the next year and not pay somebody to do it. And boom, there's an info, but I'm not wasting time because I'm creating an automated platform or a system that I can take 10 minutes to do each month or whatever it is along the way. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, you have to kind of figure it out, but leverage as much templating systems, workflow, you know, uh, people, you know, that have done it before that, that, that you can. Yeah. And, and also founders stop doing your business out of your checking account. You're a founder. Now you have a business yep. step up to the plate and take that checking account inf information and download it into QuickBooks or one of the other forms, right, Brad? Yeah, one of the things that when we have a client that's kind of getting more professional or shows some growth and they're like, hey, I need some help. This is getting too big for me. A lot of them are still looking and managing their business every day at their bank account. They're looking at my bank balance is going up. My bank balance is going up. Well, that's great in theory, right? But what does that mean from a profitability standpoint, right? So you need to start measuring profitability, which, you know, from a cash flow perspective, Andy's spreadsheet can can do where it's like, where are all the inflows or the outflows? But kind of as you start looking at a profitable business, profitable business, whether you're in a service-based company, a tech company, a product, you know, based company, food and drink, whatever it is, understanding your margins and, and ensuring that you have, like, what is your break-even point? Like, what is your margin? So by margins, what do I mean, right? If you're a product-based company, how product-based company selling phones or sunglasses. Well, how much does it cost to get one sunglasses at your warehouse ready to sell to a customer? And what are you making off of that, right? Uh, from a uh, service-based company, how much time is are you taking spending time, like billable hours to create that solution from for a company, whether it's an accounting firm, marketing firm, things like that, and how much are you selling it for, right? You got to understand that margin of the cost versus the, the revenue because what we see with a lot of companies, especially the product-based companies, their sales and their deposits from Amazon that they're using to sell their products are and keep going up. But when they actually break down, look at the forecast of like, okay, let's look at this actual data. What is my gross revenue? How much did I discount on that gross revenue? What are the actual product costs that I had made from that deposit? And how much advertising did I spend? After you kind of break down the numbers, sometimes it's so glaring for people because they're like, whoa, I made 20 grand. But net, I'm basically paid thirty thousand dollars to make that twenty grand. So I'm negative ten thousand. But all you were looking at was that twenty grand deposit in your bank account, which is breaking down in terms of the subsets of those numbers. So once you get to that aspect, it's about profitability margins and understanding that. Um, and so there's a little bit of a walkway to that, and that's when you kind of need to start really understanding all that aspect of it. And that's what Wise Up Wednesdays are for everybody. So we can up our founder game and you're a first time founder. Don't feel badly or any shame around this. There's no training for this role as founder. This is just one more thing you need to learn and skin your knees on <laughs> and mm -hmm. figure out as a founder and, and moving your business forward. And you know, once you know better, you do better. And putting these systems into place is so important. Many a business has gone under just on what Brad just said there. They saw all this revenue coming in. They're like, ah, first quarter, we did this, we're amazing. But they didn't, They all of a sudden they were like out of money. How'd that happen? We had all this money come in. Well, you had a lot go out too, or you may not have realized there was gonna be hidden costs for what you're doing. And so that's important. I also wanna talk a little bit about break-even analysis because to me, that's when you can celebrate everybody. That's a really defining moment. Talk a little bit about break even, Brad. Yeah, so kind of understanding your break even is basically where you're at a net, you know, at, at a zero dollar situation, right? So we have kind of if we just break it down in terms of what that means, like what is the revenue or the sales money coming in, right? What are the variable costs associated with that sale? So the variable costs are if you're a product-based company, the actual product that you sold for that. If you're a, you know, a labor company or a service-based company, the labor, if you're a tech platform, the hosting and the variable costs related with those sales, right? And then once you're able to do that, then you look at the fixed expenses, the rent, the utilities, the, the salary of administrators, you know, administrative payroll taxes, that type of stuff. And once you're able to kind of figure that out, you're able to kind of see where your break-even point is. So if you're a, you know, if you, let's just kind of do an example, you're you, you, you basically, let's say your variable costs or your cost of your product is 
40% of your actual sales number, and then your break, uh, your fixed costs are $50,000, right? So if we look at it, let's say you sell $100, 40% of that is for $40, right? Right. So basically there's $60 left over there to cover fixed expenses and your fixed expenses, I said, was $50. So then boom, you're at $10 left over in profit. So $100 is above your break even point, but you're able to kind of figure that out in, in that aspect. So understand your break even point is kind of, you know, is what Andy says is when you're looking at a business, you're starting it, cash, how much cash do I have? How do I get to where I want to go? But then also when is going to be that point when I'm going to actually going to be tipping the lever a little bit and be like, wow, I feel like there's some, you know, situation here, you know, in, 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 in seeing that this is a profitable enterprise or can be along the way and understanding that. The one thing I will say is, you know, Andy said it when we were talking about, you know, reporting and things like that, is that the the hidden costs, right? So just be clear of what those costs are. What What is your income tax burden possibly going to be, right? When you're a service-based company, a Schedule C, like your self-employment taxes can be really big and you may not be planning for it. And so you should be planning for it, right? Um, you know, but also like if you have employees and you don't have proper payroll systems in place, are you paying the taxes in? Because once you start getting behind on these things and you get that debt, like all those credit card debt, then all of a sudden it piles up. It's hard to get out of. Just don't take those cash flow loans from Cabbage or PayPal or Amex or Shopify that exist these days because you can press a button, it comes in, but then you owe money and a lot of those are like 20% interest. So you got to just be under clear of kind of where money comes from these days and when what you have to pay back and how it comes into play. Because there's times, you know, we've had one of our clients years ago and came to us and basically they're like, oh, yeah, I never um, uh, followed my income taxes. And we're like, why? They're like, we never made any money. And I'm like, okay, well, that doesn't make any sense. What do you, didn't, didn't you live personally and things like that? We're like, yeah, we, you know, we, we paid for our mortgage and things like that. And I'm like, so basically you had a net zero because you paid for all your business expenses and personal. Well, then you're going to have a huge tax burden because personal expenses aren't deducted. That's so it's right. like those things that it took them five, six years to get out of because they just weren't properly aligned with somebody and, 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 and chatted with somebody about, hey, do I have to file taxes? You know, it, it, some people, it's just, it depends on your situation. So just stay ahead of that game. Otherwise, the other situation we're talking about is really hard to get out of. Yeah. And I put it right into the cash flow projection. I put it on, you know, into whatever I'm doing for monthly is peeling off 15%, just right off the top of what the revenue coming in, putting it aside for taxes, making the quarterly estimated payments. You know, again, this is why you hire accountfully because it, it, it's too much of a burden for you or you just shut down around this. Get somebody who will help you be accountable around the money because you don't want your business to tank because of that. It can tank because there's no market who wants it. Nobody wants to buy your product. It can tank for, you know, pandemic reasons, but you do not want it to um, tank over the financials. You can do better and become more knowledgeable. One of my favorite books too, Brad, is Profit First mm -hmm. by Mike Michalowicz because I like his um, mindset as well, where you peel off, even if it's a dollar, profitability. Because at the end of the day, you really do want your business to serve you in financially wonderful ways. And if you get into that mindset and you're really understanding and tracking your money, you can pull that dollar off and or whatever percentage of revenue, put it into a separate account, use it to put it back into the business, invest in your business, or take you and your darling for a vacation <laughs> or get that car you wanted if you're doing really well. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I know it's a, it's a great book in terms of helping kind of founders and, and, and situation of understanding kind of the differences of where money needs to go and where I need to allocate it. Sometimes the practice of implementing four bank accounts or five bank accounts is sometimes really hard to account for and to manage, but if that, you know, gets you where it's at, but it really helps you understand, you know, the profits that I should be having or I should expect to have or the goal to have profits, right? The goal of what am I paying myself as an owner? What do I need to allocate for taxes and then what's left over from expenses? But the one of the things I really do enjoy about it is it's like he calls it real revenue, not just revenue, but real revenue is really your gross profit of your business because it's he looks at it like I don't care what your top line revenue is. He says whatever your top line plus the products you sold for that is what your real revenue is to be able to support your overhead, your profits, your taxes, etc. So it kind of helps, you know, you uh, a business owner or a person kind of change your mindset of understanding, okay. 
that's left over to cover overhead. That's left over to cover some taxes and things like that. So it kind of helps compartmentalize the financials and to make it kind of more, um, I think, simple and more approachable for a lot of founders versus looking at a spreadsheet and be like, I don't know what this means. Right. And I love that real revenue. Talk to folks about what gross profit is. Yeah, gross profit is kind of goes back to kind of what of what I've stated about like break even, right? Really, gross profit is essentially your revenues less your cost of goods sold. So your cost of goods sold are is that variable expenses, which is the variable spend you have to do to create or buy those products to sell, right? So again, if you're a food uh, product based business, you're selling something tangible like a phone or a soda or whatever. It's easy to understand. Hey, that costs three dollars to make. I'm selling for five. I have two dollars left over. But when you're a, a, a service-based company, really understanding your billable hours, right? Your inventory that you're selling is billable hours, and understanding that and, and what your margins or what you're making off those billable hours. So you know, if you're a founder and you're you're buying and selling products, it, it's easier to understand that. But if you're a founder and you're you're selling or creating a marketing firm, it's just you yourself or you and your husband or wife or a co-partner or founder, sometimes it's hard to understand that because you're like, I'll work 100 hours just to make that money and break even because I'm, I'm hustling. But when you start getting more people involved, then you need to start understanding kind of your margins and gross profit to then support all those fixed expenses of revenues or excuse me, of advertising, marketing, um, you know, G&A, rent, payroll, things like that. So um, I'll have all the um, the. Uh, Oh my gosh, the ratios in the formulas in the show notes, everybody, for what we're talking about today. And it's really hard as a solopreneur. I mean, you can easily just say, what? You know, I've got my home office, I, you know, website, uh, some marketing, I've got to pay monthly fees for MailChimp, this and that. So what? 500 bucks a month? It's all pure profit. Uh, no, you have your time. <laughs> and you have to yeah. understand that your time, a third of it will be working on admin a third of it's going to be working on marketing and the other third is going to be delivering the value and what folks are paying you to do until you can start leveraging until you until you can start bringing people in and there's a cost to that so when you start tracking your time and this is a really valuable exercise everybody when you start tracking your time and have a little yellow sticky on your on your computer screen that says is this going to help me make money <laughs> If you have that constant reminder and start tracking your time, you will see how much time you do waste and it'll help you put in better boundaries so that you're focused on money generating activities only during the hours you've decided to work. Definitely. So, I would, uh, you know, to kind of mirror that when we, <clears throat> when we started, we were like, Hey, we're going to charge a fixed fee to be your bookkeeper, your accountant. Right. And we would just do it. It was very cheap rates versus what we are now. But, um, we never tracked time like the first year or two. And all of a sudden we did it and we're like, whoa, we are like literally spending 30 hours a month on this client making $450, right? And so when you start kind of visualizing that, you're like, okay, now I can understand how much time it takes to do something. So I, I you know, be very conscious of your time. I would say that there's really three finite resources from a small business owner that you need to really be conscious of, right? Number one is time. There's only so much time. Number two is talent. There's only so much talent. And number three is money. There's only so much cash and money, right? Like, so how do you maximize those three things? The talent that you're bringing on your team or that you have, the time that you have to focus on the business and then leveraging the cash that you currently have to make more of it, right? So when you're investing that money you have with an accountant or an advisor or a marketing firm, is that is there a return on that investment where either they're helping you grow your revenue or make smarter decisions, or they're doing something that you don't want to do. And in that time that they're doing it, you're spending those three or four hours on things that really you're good at, like growing your business or focusing on core operations or business development. And, and understanding and looking at it that way really helps people understand like, okay, now I can understand where do I use that money the most to then take my business to that next level of the next three, four, five months. And frankly, founders, your number one job is business development. <laughs> or operation, so, business development. Like those two are your things. Don't worry about the stuff from the behind the scenes. Go forward and figure it out. Yep. That, that there are fun. people for that. There are systems and procedures for that. Yep. You're out there pushing the vision and making sure things are operating smoothly. That's a really good point, Brad. Really good point. So there are other some other terminology 
things that folks struggle with, founders struggle with, and that's, you know, understanding what is the net income slash loss, and this is before EBITDA, you probably have heard of that, but also there's cash burn or churn, and then there's runway. Let's talk about these three terms so founders can have a better understanding of, and let's begin with that net income. And yeah. how do you how do you um, calculate that, and, and how do you look at that over a period of time or at a certain point in time, et cetera? So from a standpoint of looking at net income, what that is is your revenues, less cost of goods sold, less expenses, right? It, what, what net income is, you're basically your, it, it's the end number of your profit and loss statement that if you look at QuickBooks and, um, and any of these accounting systems. What it does is it shows you profitability, right? And, and, and you're able to assess, is this a sustainable company over time because I'm making money or I'm losing money? So it's a really good gauge of that, right? We basically recommend closing your books each month and looking back at where it's at. But at a minimum, you know, quarterly looking back, try to you know look at that cash flow forecast or a budget and compare against it, right? So profitability shows how sustainable is this in from a business standpoint moving forward and you have a lot of investors or people looking at it hey is the re if the revenues grow is this thing going to make money because i want to return on my investment right right and this that's where that kind of comes into play there and this is so important for those of you who have investors as advisors um again i don't highly recommend a board until you're into a series a <laughs> position with your company. Um, but if that has happened, and it can during a seed round where you have board of advisors, you have to communicate this information to them, especially on a quarterly. And again, unless you've, you've raised Series A, you don't have time for monthly meetings with the advisors. Sorry, advisors, that's just how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> it's healthier. So let's talk about, you know, the monthly burn rate, because we, we've been talking about it. I just want to, again, up your knowledge as to you're going to hear people say, well, what's your churn rate? Yeah. What's the so churn rate? Burn, monthly burn is basically just focused on essentially what's the net cash difference from where you started to where you end the month, right? So it's basically the spreadsheet that Andy had. So not to get too complex, but you have basically in the financials, you have the profit and loss, which looks at revenues, expenses, costs of goods sold, and sees long-term profitability. And then you have the balance sheet that is cash, assets, and like liabilities, debt, and equity, right? So what the, basically the kind of burn, monthly burn of cash inflow or outflow is net basically of what I made or what money I had at the start of the month and what money I had at the end of the month. And why I'm bringing this all up is because what Andy's spreadsheet was was great because it included both profit and loss items, expenses, revenues, costs, as well as balance sheet items of taxes owed, of debt, of accounts payable, of accounts receivable, things like that, that also factor into play here. So for example, you could have the most profitable month ever um, for your business from the profit and loss statement, but you could have a huge negative cash flow month because let's say that you had a positive, let's say you had one big sale during the month and like, you know, $200,000 of revenue. Well, let's say you invoiced your customer, you had one customer and you invoiced them for 200,000, but you didn't get paid that month. Okay. But you still had to pay payroll, rent and everything else associated with it. Well, your cash churn or your cash burn that month is going to be negative, but then you have this $200,000 that you should be receiving at some months. Right? So when you're looking at your business, you have to, under, at the end of the day, cash is king, right? We have to focus on this cash burn each month and understanding basically where I'm at today. And if I project out, what is the number of months I have on hand of my business, depending upon where I'm forecasting revenue, sales, and other things. But also understanding on a month over month basis from a sustainability, what my profit and loss is and, and how it compares month over month that comes along the way, which is why we, again, when you kind of look at management accounting and nursing your business, you have to look at accrual based financials and cash because it all nets out in terms it of sure how it does. Yeah. And if you're working with a large corporate, a big box company, and you're not part of their supplier diversity pro program, getting net 10 days terms is just not going to happen. You're yeah. going to go out at least 90 days. Um, you know, maybe you're really good at negotiating and you can get them to help you out as a small business, which is wonderful, but you have to figure that out. And the other wonderful benefit of these types of tools and this type of understanding folks is the fact that you will see when you are too heavily invested into one customer, all of a sudden you're going to see that one customer is providing all of the 
well, what if you lose that customer? What if something happened to them? What if they had to shut down because there's a pandemic? You need to always be looking at diversifying and uh, your portfolio, so to speak, of customers and, and clients. What are mm. your thoughts on that, Brad? Yeah, two things. Number one, on um, the diversification, that has really helped Accountfully kind of maintain and you know, be sustainable and getting back to hiring mode now um, after the last couple of months of being flat because we have such a diverse um, portfolio of clients from an industry specific as well as across the nation, plus the percentage of total revenue, right? So as what's been great about Accountfully is we've grown our business by helping other clients, and, and but we've also seen all of their pain points and some of the bad decisions they've made. So it's made us better advisors of realizing we had some clients that were 70% of the revenue was one business and they allocated all their resources. They never, they gave them benefit and preferential treatment on pricing and all this stuff. They really never made full margins. And then that one day the business is like, we're moving somewhere else. And then they had to get rid of, you know, 55, 60% of their team because they couldn't sustain anymore. So really understanding that and clearly with the COVID situation, this has completely blown this out of proportion, not proportion, but really brought it to the front of the, you know, light here for everybody to understand. The one thing I will say is we're talking about cash here, right? So if we think about cash, right, a lot of times we have to understand what is the cash cycle of when you're providing a product or service and when you're getting paid for it, right? So if you're buying, in, you know, you want that cash cycle basically to either be zero or as close to zero or negative. And by that, I mean, if you're providing a service, do we really need to wait to the end of the month to invoice for that service? Or can we invoice at the start of the month? and try to get paid before we actually work on that because then we're ahead of the game from a cash perspective, right? If you're an hourly, uh, if you're working on a monthly fixed fee, it's easier to do that up front versus a, you know, an hourly situation where you have to add your numbers up and you bill them after the fact and you next you know it's like you're not getting paid till 45 days after you did the work. Similar on the product side, right? Like when you're buying an inventory product, how long are you bringing it in? How long is it in your in in uh, warehouse? When did you pay for it? And then when is somebody going to pay you for it, right? So again, as Andy says, it depends upon who your customer is. Because a lot of times if you're working for corporations or big box stores, you're not going to be able to dictate anything. You're just whatever they say. <laughs> but if you're a small business and you're helping other small businesses, what if you, instead of go hourly, you bring your price point down a little bit, you basically invoice them the first of the month and you get them set up on auto drafts. So literally, you get it in your bank account by the fourth of the month and you're executing the entire month. So there's different ways to think about it. It may not be as profitable full-time because you may be doing more work, but again, cash is king, especially when you're starting out. So you have to understand when you're going to get money from your customers. Right. And those are great decisions that we need to be making. And, and that's why I say uh, after having a food manufacturing business with the shelf life, as God is my witness, I'll never do anything with the shelf life again. <laughs> because yes. You throw out a lot of things after they expire. That's what I'm talking about. Um, another thing I want to talk about too, is for folks who are raising money, you know, that slide on your pitch deck, use of funds. And you're going to have, we're raising a million and we're going to be spending 250K on this uh, product development. We're going to spend 250K on, on marketing. We're going to hire some people. The best way to wow investors is to have a backup slide to that that shows that you really understand what it means to get a million dollars into your business and how you're going to create the runway for that. How are you going to extend the runway? And that is Sometimes the challenge of when you're raising money with venture capital, because you don't have much of a runway, which is why it's even more important you understand how to use that money over that period of time. And just in case you have the question why you don't have much of a runway is because venture capital are looking for their money back as soon as possible. Angels have a little more flexibility on that. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk about runway. And again, founders really nailed down when you are putting up the use of funds, 250K for your MVP or, or product dev, why is it 250? Go deep, again, bring in someone like Brad and his team to help you create those numbers. But let's talk about runway, Brad. Yeah, no, I think it's definitely a great topic, right? And, and where it's always kind of that situation, right? Like in terms of knowing where you're going to go, you need to know where you came from, right? So again, having an idea of what your break even point, what your monthly fixed, fixed expenses are, what is your current debt on hand, what is your cash situation, understanding your gross margins of your, of your, uh, of your sales, et cetera, right? So the best place to start before you do that is to know where you're at. 
and then you can kind of really understand, okay, this is where I'm at. Then once you understand where you're at, which is key about having monthly financials and things like that, then you're like, okay, I'm going to raise X number of dollars and this is how it's going to last. And basically I'm going to use that money to a lot of, you know, the, the focus of money, right, is that lasts as long as possible. And so a lot of that money that you get is going to need to be spent on, you know, marketing, advertising, increasing top line revenue, as well as in core operations, right? Like if you're a tech company or things like that, it is based around like, you know, developing your product and hiring more developers and things like that, right? They're not going to want you to, you know, spend that money on bigger rent or more expensive rent, but it's how to increase and how to get to that next level of series, how to raise that brand, how to raise that valuation right. along the way. So on top of the outflows of money, it's very key of understanding, all right, what are my basically kind of unit economics or uh, essentially marketing ROI, right? So having that pinned down of saying, all right, what is my cost to acquire a customer? What is my average lifetime value of a customer? What are they gonna spend? Those types of things and those metrics and that kind of comes more from a marketing function versus an uh, accounting finance function. But having all that together, then once you have those, then you can really create a cool little kind of forecast and have that mentality behind the brain and, and, the, and, and why you're going to go to where you go. We've all seen Shark Tank and things like that. When you're basically like, I know where I'm at and this is what I need and this is where exactly it goes, it wows people. It's like, okay, good. That's one thing I don't need to worry about. Now, do I like the product, the market? That's a different conversation. But if you have that squared away, they're like, remember, they're giving you their money. So they're putting their trust in you. And then they're saying, all right, they have that aspect of the business handled. Great. Now they can focus on really the front end of the business and the product, the market fit and all that type of stuff. And this is why I'm always saying, founders, when you start your business, you've got to have your team in place, the winning team. And the winning team is a good lawyer who's going to protect you. And a good accountant is going to ask you really good questions and help you with the money. And this is, you know, you can go, well, you can you know, do the old barometer check if you want. Do yourself a favor. Get that money in the door from investors by taking time out with Brad and his team or your favorite accountant bookkeeper. Now, someone with a little bit more accounting is really what you need because they're going to ask you those tough questions that you would not have thought or recalled. And it's going to just you're going to look like a superstar with the investor money. Yeah, we were talking the other day when we were doing our tech check and you told a really fun, important story. I mean, I howled, but it's just so true. And it's that sometimes when you're looking at the numbers, you just like you don't want to deal with the fact that you're losing money and you're bleeding it way up here. You're going to turn to something that's maybe a 10 or $20 item. Mm -hmm. Can you share that story? And, and we were talking yeah. about that the office expense story and yeah. then we'll wrap up. So similar to myself, right? I wasn't a very sophisticated business person before I, you know, started this business, right? Like you're dealing in corporate world, like literally when you're in corporate world, you don't learn a small business, you don't learn anything, right? You basically come in, then when you learn a small business, you're trying to focus on things in, in, in different situations and learning. And so when a lot of our clients come to us and we're like reviewing financials each month with them or quarterly, a lot of times, when they're not that sophisticated or done it before, they come in and we're like, okay, here's your numbers. You lost this much money, your revenue didn't grow, your gross profit went up. We don't know how, you know, we have an inventory adjustment of $20,000. And we're saying all these things and talking about key metrics like you know, gross margin, contribution margin, that type of stuff. And all of a sudden they're like going through, they're like, what's in that office supplies line? And we're like, it's $300. Like that is immaterial to the overall aspect of the business. And it's like, goes in, they're like, oh, that Dropbox shouldn't go there. That should go to a different one. And we're like, okay, noted. Great. We'll work on that. We'll adjust it. But what is the big picture here? Like the big picture is not that. The big picture is understanding financials, understanding your profitability, understanding your margins, understanding where you're going to go, your cash flow forecasts, how many months on hand you have, right? Again, we don't want to be, you know, uh, we want to be frugal. We don't want to overspend on things. But again, when you get to a point, you need to allocate a budget to it and just let it be and be like, turn for the dollars. It's not going to do it. If that's going to help me run my business or whatever, great. But that's not going to change you selling, you know, your product more, your margins more, you know, and really taking your business to the next level until you get out of the weeds and focus up top creatively and things like that. While knowing what's going on, you don't spend on things you don't need to. I'm not saying that, I'm just saying when you're talking to an advisor, things like that, understand the big picture as well versus just these little things. Yeah, you don't wanna to get too caught up in the weeds. Oh my gosh, anything that we didn't hit on that you wanna specifically share before I wrap everything up? No, we, we hit it no, all, right? I think we hit everything, to be honest with you. It's, oh uh, 
I mean, we can go into real detail and everything, but it's not worth it. I, you know, of course, I'm fanning myself because this is the kind of conversation I love. And, and I, of course, always hire to help create. I know just enough on QuickBooks mm -hmm. and, uh, and all, but um, it's just so great, Brad, talking to you about all of these important numbers. Uh, and I know folks are going to benefit from our conversation for years to come. These things just do not change. Okay. We can have different industries come and go. The numbers and how you track them are the best. Oh, thank you. And Mary, I'll thank you for tuning in. I know that you're working and developing your skill set in this area. So, so grateful. And for all the other folks who have been tuning in, um, Brad, you're a founder. I always like to find out how has being an entrepreneur, a founder, benefited you, both professionally and personally? I would say, I mean, professionally, I've never had a bigger network of people that I can rely upon or connect with. And, and, and you know, like, I mean, Andy, like I'm talking to you today, I've never met you and never would have been able to meet you. And now I know about you and things like that. Right. So I, mean, I would say that is professionally like, uh, you know, I, I'm, I feel like I know small business very well. And I think 80% of what's going on in the world is small business. So really understanding kind of that and understanding um, how that operates from a personal standpoint. I mean, just going from an actual accountant bookkeeper, going out and hustling, doing the work, doing the work, then all of a sudden realizing, okay, how do I become a manager? How do I hire better? How do I become a better client advisor? How do I sell my service, my business and things like that, right? So basically it's enhanced my, I think, maturity, my, um, you know, like my kind of managerial skills overseeing that. My wife and I have twin three-year-olds, so I have that. Then it's like I have employees and like it's, it all kind of interrelates where I'm like, okay, managing people, overseeing, people and becoming empathizing with people, I think has been more before because sometimes you're just bullheaded up like everybody should act like I do, but a lot of people don't. So you have to understand where their position comes from and things like that. So I think it's made me kind of a more well-rounded person um, from kind of a managerial person standpoint. Um, so I yeah. love that. Great and job. then I'm going to have all the links to connect to Accountfully in the show notes. I just shared them in the comment threads as well. You want Accountfully on your team. How, what else do they need to know about Accountfully other than these wonderful links to follow you and connect with you everywhere you glow? Yeah, we're, um, Accountfully has been, I mean, we keep growing. It's great. We have clients all across the nation, across all industries. If you're interested in talking, go on our website, fill our getting started form. Um, we'll connect with you, have a call to chat about your needs and whether, you know, you're too early or what you're thinking, you know, what, what, what works best for you or whether it's more of a fully outsourced role or not. Um, you can feel free to connect on us on then. Outside of that, we have a lot of great content going out. Um, we're going to continue to enhance that. We're going to be doing like a kind of a monthly interview or a weekly interview soon, um, similar to Andy, um, as well as kind of we have some ebooks going out. So really, really focusing on education and, and, and content to kind of you know help empower people like uh, that are on this um, interview today, um, but then help them understand that. But also then they can help. You know, we're here to help advise and, and support you in your journey. Well, who wouldn't feel trust and faith with you? That's what I want to know. <laughs> it's the first thing I, I noticed about you, Brad, is that I immediately felt that I could count on you to come through, especially with complicated information like numbers. So yay, yay, yay. We had a great chat with Brad. And um, I just want to go over some last minute notes with all of you here. And that is if you have any questions for Brad, for me, pop them into the comment threads, shoot us an email, uh, hop onto accountfully.com. And Brad, has, it just pops up right there. You can chat with Brad anytime you want. He's right there. For those of you who are watching the replay, please share your questions too, any advice, anything like that. Keep the conversation going and be sure to click the subscribe button if you haven't already and the little bell so you get alerted whenever I have a new show, a new uh, video that I've uploaded. For those of you who are raising capital, I know you want to be prepared for a successful outcome, right? So I encourage you to download these questions. Let me just pull this baby up right here. I have curated a list of questions that investors typically ask and the answers that you're going to want to have for them. And because it is a red flag to investors when you can't answer these questions. I also include questions you need to ask investors. The last thing you want 
is money from an angel or VC who is not aligned with your business. So visit bit.ly backslash Andy Investor QA and download this document. It will make you more confident. I promise you will feel so much better knowing that these questions are there for you. Next on Feb Founder Friday. Oh my gosh, it's the amazing Anna Pereira, founder of the Wellness Universe. She's joining us to share her startup stories. Let me just pull this up here. There she is, tips for building a successful online community. And I am telling you, this woman has done it. She can answer all your questions because it really can be like herding cats when you're trying to build a community online. Any of you who've tried to do it, you know. So I hope we see you on Friday, August 14th at 11 a.m. to hear her best tips and strategies. She's gonna be coming to us live from beautiful Portugal where she spends half of her time there in, in New Jersey. So Brad, thank you so much for joining me and, and bringing such incredible information to not just the Startup Life community, but I know this will benefit, as I said earlier, founders for years to come. Any last thoughts you'd like to share before we say goodbye? No, this has been a great conversation. I hope uh, everybody listening has taken at least one thing from here and can really expand upon it and take it, you know, uh, hopefully it's a value add for your business. And if not, we're always here to come through the chat further, but no, this is great. I think uh, Andy, your topics and your uh, table of contents and what we chatted on is really a good start for all the, uh, the small uh, the startups that are out there in the world. Excellent. Remember what Brad said about the three finite resources, right? Time, money, and talent. Talent. Oh my gosh. We have other stories that we could talk about with that. All right, everybody, founders, thank you so much for tuning in. Stay strong, stay focused, and remember, you've got this. I believe in you. See you next time. Bye. Mwah.